All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to By His Blood Ministries Wednesday night Bible study. Pray that everyone's having a good day. Uh, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 24 today. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study your holy word. We pray that as we we receive it, that we not only receive it, but we, we take into account that it applies to us. That it was written for us, that it was written for our instruction, it was written for our correction, it was written for our reproof, that we may be better disciples of Christ through the things of the past. Allow us to, to see these things for what they are, allow us to look at ourselves for what we are, and allow us to grow in the process, Lord. I pray that uh, you bless each and every individual here, you bless the people at home, that you allow us to be consumed by the Holy Spirit so that the word and the spirit may work as one and, and, and put us on the path that you want us on, Lord. May we take seriously the, the things that you put before us, the, the purposes and the, the need to evangelize, the need to share you, and the need to truly be a part of the solution, Lord. Let us do these things. Let us bring honor to your name. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. All right, so uh, announcements for the week. Tomorrow, high set training, going to be in that room right there. Uh, again, this is not a GED. This is actually a high school diploma. And uh, I, I really can't think of a better way to do it if the Lord has laid on your heart that you need to continue your education. Um, Friday, we are off. Saturday, homeless ministry, where at? Sears Girl Spot. Uh, that would be on South Road, across Ole Guacamole. Uh, the, the original location we've used for years. We're going to uh, try again, see if the the our, our everything changes. We've talked to a bunch of people. They say they're going to be there, and we'll see. Hopefully, they can. Yep, it's called Washerama. Washerama is right. And uh, Gary, uh, Pastor Gary, has come up with a, a great idea that we're going to put into action. Um, one of the reasons that the crowds have kind of dwindled is uh, our wonderful uh, John City Police Force has yeah. once again determined that uh, harassing the homeless is, is uh, again, a top priority as opposed to the other things that are going on. And uh, I've seen it at least three times right down here on the corner. Uh, they will stop the homeless. They will make them empty out their backpacks on the street. Uh, and the homeless just don't feel like being bothered by it. So what we're doing is uh, Gary has, has, has suggested, I'm sorry, Pastor Gary has suggested that we make some cards uh, that, uh, that have the, our, our logo and the laundry ministry on it, has an expiration date. So if they get stopped by a police officer or someone, they can show proof that they have a place that they're going and a purpose that they're going and uh, they will be allowed to move on their way. So we're working on that and uh, what we will ask each of y'all to do is to keep some of these cards with you and hand them out to the homeless that you see, um, which might take you out of your comfort zone, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, on Sunday, we have service here at 11. Uh, also have Fifth Sunday, which is going to be a Mexican motif. Yes. Yeah, enchiladas, you know, just, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Mexican, uh, and uh, I don't know what all is being prepared, but I know it's going to be delicious, and I know it's going to be a good time of fellowship and fun. I mean, we, uh, every time we've done this, it's been great, and uh, I'm glad that we're doing it. It's important that we, we have time outside of just service where we can spend time together and get to know each other. Uh, Monday, we have Overcomers Outreach at 7.30. Uh, that is a uh, Christ-centered 12-step. Uh, it, it's like like everything else. It's been up and down um, as far as attendance goes, but we can't ever let that discourage us. Uh, you know, if you think that that, <laughs> if you're discouraged by that, feel free to go back to day one of Buy His Blood Ministries on our uh, webpage or on our YouTube or uh, I don't even know if we were doing Facebook at that time, but uh, feel free to go all the way back to there when we had three people in a little lobby of a hotel and, uh, 
you know, the Lord has done some amazing things. If you're able to touch one person with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've done it. Amen. So uh, it's not a matter of, of, of quantity. It's a matter of, of getting the message out. Because that one person may share it with 50 people. Therefore, you're a part of that. So um, remember that. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, women's group, 630. Not sure if they're having it here. Not sure what's going on. Do you know? I know it's going to happen. I just don't know where. I will get the information and we will have that on Sunday. Because uh, actually, you know, this week was the prayer week. And then, yeah. So, um, so I'm sure that Nikki will keep everyone informed on that. I uh, also have the high set training again at 530 right in there. And then next Wednesday, we'll be right back here for Deuteronomy chapter 25. Now, for the past few chapters, what's been going on is we've been going through a lot of laws and a lot of things that God has, uh, God has mandated for his people. And they, it falls into the category of keeping Israel holy. So Israel is to be different than the people around them. And we have also been able to see where everything that he has commanded has been attached to the moral law has been attached to the Ten Commandments, and you know we can boil it down even even smaller than that. And and you know the reason that we need to boil it down smaller than that is because guess what? <laughs> we are a people that does better with very little. So um, love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So you know. We, we, we deceive ourselves so many times in life and we say, you know, what I'm doing doesn't affect anyone else. You know, uh, when I was in full addiction, what I'm doing, it doesn't affect anyone else. Well, that was a huge lie. I mean, it affected my mom's life. It affected my wife's life. It affected uh, my son's life who, you know, grew up without a father because of it. It affected uh, the community around me because I was selling drugs to other people. It affected... Uh, it affected law and order because uh, I was actually selling certain things to certain police officers. There was, uh, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of people who were affected by just my problem. So um, sin has a ripple effect and it will rip through. And, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be something as obvious as addiction. Uh, you know, it can be the things that we think that we're doing in the dark. You know, um, I'll take, a, I'll, I'll give another example, uh, pornography, you know, very rarely do people publish that they're watching pornography, but it affects your marriage. It affects the mood of your spouse. It, it puts false expectations on your household. It affects the way that, uh, that you, uh, relate with the outside world. It affects many things and it justifies a lot of things that don't need to be justified that keep everything in its proper place. So there, there's everything that we do, it does affect someone else, whether we like it or not. Um, so, you know, these things he is setting in place because he doesn't want Israel, even though they have to dwell among the Canaanites. Okay, they've got their own land. They're going to create their own laws and they're going to be set apart as holy. But everyone around them is not holy. Everyone around them does things differently. So God wants his people to be different. And what makes God's people different? The morals and the ethics by which they live. So, the, I mean, there's the first, the first, you know, contextual bridge that we can build right there. What sets us apart from the world that we live in? The moral and the ethical cho choices that we make on a daily basis. Do we always make the right one? No. But do we, do we, do we come to God and do we repent and look to change that? Or do we continue to live in that sin and just say, that's just the way it is. You know, I'm covered by grace. Well, that's called, you know, abuse of grace. So we don't want to be abusers of grace, but we also understand that grace has been afforded to us because God understands that we are not perfect. So um, that is where we are. And that is what we're going to be seeing today. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a whole section here starting with verse five that's called nothing but miscellaneous laws. Um, now, the first laws are concerning divorce. Divorce is not God's plan, okay? Just because 
there is a section here on divorce does not mean that it was God's plan. Just like people always say, well, you know, well, not people, but there's certain people. And there's even certain religions that say because David and Solomon and, 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 and uh, Abraham and, and, and Jacob had multiple wives, that it's God's intention for man to have multiple wives. That's not true. God states plainly in Genesis chapter 2, one man, one woman, one flesh. One man, one woman, one flesh. One man, one woman, one flesh. Those people made decisions. That was not God's way. And we see that those decisions had repercussions throughout their entire lives. Eventually, even to the division of Israel into Israel and Judah, you know, which goes to say that what Solomon did in his bedroom was not just his business. It was everyone's business because it affected the entire nation of Israel. So um, that is where we're, we are. Um, a divorce was a concession made by God to man. And there were only two reasons for divorce. It says any cause is the translation in Hebrew and any cause translates to adultery and abandonment. So if your spouse cheats on you, God as a concession allowed you to get a divorce. If your spouse abandoned you, just disappeared. You know, if a man left his house with the military, went off to war and never returned, wasn't, wasn't, you know, didn't lose his life in war or whatever, just ran off with, with a foreign woman or whatever. As a concession, God allowed them to issue a certificate of divorce. So it says, starting with verse one, it says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then he finds no, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, so the indecency in her would have to be adultery. If this divorce is going to be granted, it had to be adultery. So if she commits adultery and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. Okay, so now we have to look at what constitutes marriage in the Bible. If anyone can show me dating in the Bible, I will be glad to, to entertain you pointing that out to me because I haven't found it. Dating is a, a westernized concept that was developed in the 1920s. Prior to that, most marriages were arranged marriages. Most marriages were between families and most marriages were... Uh, well, all marriages were, were, were outside of the dating process as we see it today. It was at the moment of consummation, that's when they were married. So there is no dating in the Bible. Marriage happens at the point of intercourse. So what this is saying is she goes out and sleeps with another man. And the latter man hates her and writes a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who has sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. Now you may be like, why? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, obviously at one time they loved each other. Maybe they changed. Well, no. Because after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination to the Lord. It is no longer one man, one woman. At that point, it's been two men, one woman. And that is an abomination to the Lord. She has defiled herself with another man. Therefore, the first man cannot take her back. So, I mean, how many times have you seen that? I, I see it more and more where people get divorced, they go out and they get remarried, and then they marry their original spouse. I know some people, I know, I know one couple that's been married four times to each other. I'm like, that's that's craziness. <laughs> that's craziness. Now, if he divorces her, 
Can he take her back? And she, no, because remember, what was she divorced for the first time? It was for adultery. She's already been defiled. Because the only two grounds of divorce are abandonment and adultery. So if he let her go, he can't take her back. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So why can't you do that? Because God doesn't want sin in his nation. Israel is God's nation. That is why I've said a million times, we are not Israel. It does not say that the United States of America is God's nation. Now, our, our founding fathers wrote in that we were one nation under God, but God never declared us as his nation. Have you read it? I haven't seen it anywhere. Okay, I was just making sure I, I was reading correctly. Yeah. Pretty sure that, that the, the Bible was written before the United States was in existence. <laughs> so, um, so you know, that those are just some of the, the basic marriage laws. You know, you're with your partner for life. And if your partner defiles themselves and you tell them to leave, it's done. It's done. So that is uh, some of the some of the the laws concerning marriage. There are more marriage laws that we will get into at a different time. But then it goes into that section of just miscellaneous laws. And Gary, if you have anything to add or take away, feel free to do so whenever you are whenever you, you know it's laid on your heart. But it says, when a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. So this means that he can't be uh, in the army. He can't serve um, with the Census Bureau. He can't, he can't be required by the state of Israel to do any specific job that would pull him away from the home because God understands that it is important for a husband and wife to establish their relationship together. Remember that these relationships were built upon consummation. Many times, the husband and the wife, I'm sure that they, they knew each other to an extent, but they definitely didn't know what it was like to be husband and wife together. I don't care how long you date someone, when, when you marry someone, it is a completely different picture. I, I've, I've done, uh, I've talked to, to so many people that, are, that say, well, you know, we've lived together for so long, it's just like being married. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, 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 no. Escape is easy before marriage. Escape is expensive afterwards. <laughs> um, no, escape is easy before marriage. You can just walk away from it. But now that you've made those vows before God, it, 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 it's not easy. And it, and it says he shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. So God's saying this man needs to be at home for a year. He needs to build a relationship with his wife. They need to learn their likes and their dislikes. They need to learn how to coexist, how to cohabitate, how to uh, structure their lives. They need that year to make plans. When are we going to have children? Um, what, what is the, the household dynamic going to look like? What is, uh, you know, what are our plans? What are our dreams? What are we wanting to build? What are we working towards? God understands that all of that is important. Now, what we, can, what we can look at and what we can take away from that is we as a people today need to look at this with, with, with a logical mind. If God is expecting this, and remember we, I kept using this word last week, immutable. If God is immutable, right? If God is immutable, why would he want anything different different? When we get married, God expects us as husbands and as wives to be in the home. And, and what we see so often is we see that man and wife become so consumed with the monetary aspect of marriage that they don't build that relationship. Oftentimes, they, they work so much that they get maybe an hour, hour and a half together. They don't get to spend time. Now, later on in the marriage, it's a little bit different. Notice it says for a year. After that year, that man could be called to public service. He could go to the army. He could do any of those things. But that relationship has been established for that year. And that year is the foundation of that marriage. 
So we, as, as, as disciples of Christ, we have to understand the importance of marriage in God's eyes and the importance of a solid relationship. Because we will learn and we will see as time goes on that that marriage will change. And if in that year we have rooted that marriage in Christ, we always have a bigger picture. We have an eternal picture that yokes us together. It's not based on jobs. It's not based on kids. It's not based on uh, interests that we have in common. It's not based on any of that. It's based on our love of Christ which our love for each other radiates from. And then as we change, we can appreciate those changes. I mean, um, I always use my household as an example because it's the example that I know best. But, you know, Nikki and I have gone through changes in our marriage. Um, you know, the things that we enjoyed doing when we first got married, we don't necessarily enjoy doing anymore. We have different interests, you know. Nikki was not into gardening when we got married. I was not into golf. I was a rugby player. She went to rugby matches with me. We went to a lot of concerts. We went to we went and did a lot of things. We still enjoy a concert, but we probably go to a concert maybe once a year. Not every weekend. That's for sure. I mean, you know, now we have a child in the picture. So that, that changes the dynamic of the household also. You know, all these dynamics change your marriage. And unless you're yoked in Christ, you will never survive. Because there's nothing bigger. You make yourself the biggest thing. And if I was the biggest thing in my household and Nikki and I didn't have that commonality in Christ, I don't know what it would look like. Um, we, uh, we do a, uh, a study in, in 180 and um, it's on dating. Um, and it's actually called outdated because it's, you know, God's way of marriage is, outdated, you know, not really, but by society standards, it's outdated. And, um, you know, the divorce rate is somewhere around 50% right now, yeah. but only 22% of marriages are considered to be happy. Even the ones that stay, and that's of the ones that stay together. So 50% of the divorce and only 22% are happy. That's, that's a, a bad statistic, but the ones that are happy are the ones that are rooted in Christ. Because that is something that will never change. Christ is immutable. So no matter how much Nikki and I change, no matter how many little ones we have running around the house, God is immutable and our love of Christ is enough to get us through all of that and enough to allow us to appreciate each other on a level that is unlike any other dynamic in our lives. That's why it goes, God husband and wife, and then children. Children are below the husband and wife. Right. If you put the child above your wife, you got a problem. If you put the child above your husband, you have a problem. If you put anything above Christ, you have a problem. So that is, uh, you know, one of the miscellaneous laws. Uh, verse six has another miscellaneous law. It says, no one shall take a mill or an upper millstone and pledge. That would be taking a life in pledge. Now, you know, we've, we've seen... Uh, some some stuff <laughs> happen. Uh, you know, we we see we've seen a man killed by a uh, by a upper millstone that was thrown from a tower. So is that what they're talking about? You know, a millstone falls on someone's head and that's taking their life? No, 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 no. Okay, let's say that uh, that Joey gives me a loan, and as a pledge, he takes my mill or my upper millstone. Well, I no longer have the tools that I need to make a living. So he's taken away my livelihood and he's taken away my ability to pay back the loan that he's given me. So what, what God's saying there is if you make a loan and you take a pledge, don't take that person's career. Don't take that person's way of making money because you'll never get paid back. And you're also taking food out of their family's mouth. You're also taking, uh, taking clothing off of their, their family's back. Take something else as a pledge that they don't need to make their living. So, um, I mean, that's 100% logical. 100% logical. I mean, we, we, we talk about, you know, these things, but, you know, imagine if you went to the bank and they were like, okay, well, as a pledge for this loan, 
you can no longer do carpentry. And that's your job. You're a carpenter. Well, what am I going to do? You took away my ability to make money, and now I can't pay you back. Logical. God is logical. Right. So, you know, and, and, and you, you go back to what we were talking about, keeping it simple. Well, how is that, you know, loving God or loving your neighbor? How would you like it if someone took your ability to make money away from you? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It says, if a man, if man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, and if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that sh thief shall die. So we, we talk about, we see in the news today that there is human trafficking and people being sold into slavery and everything else. Well, if one of the brothers of Israel stole another brother and sold him as a slave, he was to be killed. Because that's not loving your, 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 your neighbor as you love yourself. Also, we look at the example of Joseph. We've already seen it happen. So why is God bringing this forth? Why, why would God even think that that can happen? Well, because Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Goes back to the bleach bottle analogy. Why does it say do not drink? Because some stupid person drank it. Yeah. <laughs> so, are hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, we, 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 we talk about all these labels and everything on, on products and how stupid they are. No, these companies are doing this to not be sued because some dummy has done it. So God is putting this out there because it's obviously been done. And it says, you shall purge the evil from your midst. So if someone is caught doing that, they shall, be, they shall die and they shall no longer be a part of Israel. And that's really the only way to eradicate that problem. That's it. Stomp it out. God believes in justice, but he believes in real justice, and he believes that it applies to everyone, which we're going to see here in just a little bit. Again, verse 8, it says, take care in a case of leprous disease to be very careful to do according to all the Levitical priests shall direct you. As I commanded them, you shall be careful to do. What God's saying right here is, Remember when the whole part in Leviticus, when it, it talks about what they do in the case of a leprous disease, how they send them outside the camp, they come back seven days, they check it. If it's still there, they send them out more. The priest is the one that checks it. They have to go to the priest. Well, the priest is, is not speaking on his own accord. He's speaking on accord of God. And that's what he's reminding the people. When the priest is talking to you, he's not talking of his own accord. It's me telling him, this is what needs to be done. So you need to pay attention to do everything that he says very carefully. It says, so you shall be careful to do. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. <laughs> he not only struck her with leprosy, at that point she was sent outside of the camp she was healed, and then she came back into the camp. So what God's saying is God's saying, not only do you need to pay attention, but I have the ability to heal you if you follow my instructions. If you follow my instructions, I can and I will heal you. But if you don't follow my instructions, you're going to be stuck. So the power of prayer, too. Moses praying. Yep, Moses prayed very hard. On it. He interceded for her. Yes, he um so, yeah, it brings up two points, you know. Uh, yeah, remember. Remember the power of prayer and remember that she followed the instructions. Now, she didn't follow the instructions the first time. That's why she got it. But anyway, she was healed and, and the Lord had the power to heal her. Verse 10. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house and collect his pledge. We have been talking about this for a long time. There is no justification for sin. If you go into someone's house and you take something that is not yours, you are stealing. It does not matter if you made them alone and you're taking something of equal value, you are stealing from that individual. So 
What do you do? It says, you shall stand outside and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. So you don't go into his house uninvited and take it. That's called stealing. It's not justified under any means. Let's go, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> not under any means. It's not, it's not condoned and there is no excuse for sin. But then it says, and if he is a poor man, you shall not keep, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as his son sets, and he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. So if his pledge is his cloak, you hold on to it while it's warm, but then you return it when it's cold. So what are you gaining in that? You're gaining a blessing, the blessing of helping your neighbor. You're gaining the blessing of loving someone as you would love yourself. And it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. So the Lord recognizes when we do the right thing. He recognizes it and he rewards it. And we can see that in our own lives. When we eradicate certain sins out of our lives, there is a freedom that comes with it. When we bless a brother or a sister, there is a there is a joy that comes with it, a joy that we can't really generate on our own, but a joy that comes from the Lord. So we have to be mindful of doing those things in all instances, in all cases. Again, we have become a people obsessed with objects, obsessed with things, and also obsessed with who owes us what. Well, let's just get down to it and see what we're really owed and what we really deserve and see if being kind to someone trumps that. And yes, it does, because we don't deserve anything. We deserve death. But through the, 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 the grace of God and through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we've been afforded life. So that was given to us. So we are to love the creator by doing as he did. Amen. Verse 14, you shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners that are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and he counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. He's counting on it for his family. He's counting on it for, for, for him to have what he needs so that is definitely loving your neighbor. Now, the guilty of sin, here's the thing. The Lord has told you to do this. I mean, that's, that's the Lord's commandment right there. Love your neighbor. Pay them when they're supposed to be paid so that, because they're counting on it. Payroll structure is different for every place, every company, but pay when you're supposed to pay. If you don't do it, you're guilty of sin. So that brings into account free will. Just because God tells us to do it, we don't have to do it. We should do it, but we don't have to because he has given us free will. This is a statement of a gift that God has given us, which is free will, which God will never violate. Now, if you choose not to do it, you'll be guilty of a sin, okay? That, that means that you have to repent, and that means in this time period, you had to wait for the Day of Atonement and everything else. But, you know, if we do that, we, we have to put that before the Lord and say, Lord, I've sinned, because that's the only way that that sin can be removed. But we are marred with sin if we act on our free will and, and do what is outside of God's will. It's God's will that we pay when we're supposed to pay so that our neighbor doesn't suffer. But we can, you know, we can have someone do a job and make them come to our office and chase them down and then they can cut what they were supposed to pay us for all kinds of excuses and we can do all kinds of things. But that's not the Lord's will. Then in verse 16, it says, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. 
Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. God will not punish us for the sins of others. That is something that we should celebrate each and every day. Amen. But you see, here's the other part of that. We also need to quit playing God and think that we can control what other people do. I don't care if it's your child or your parent. We can teach our children. We can raise them properly. We can, we can talk to them all we want to about God and we can teach them the things of God. We can teach them all that. But the world is still out there and they have free will just like we do. No matter how much we try to shut them in a closet, put them in a bubble, do whatever we want to do, eventually our children are going to have to make their own decisions. And we're not responsible for those decisions. We're not responsible for those decisions in God's eyes. Why should we make ourselves responsible for those things in our own eyes? That's putting us in a place higher than God. God knows that we can't control those things. Therefore, he's not punishing us. He's not punishing us for things that we don't have control over. But if we want to assume control, then we all of a sudden become idolaters because we are making ourselves high and mighty. It's kind of a weird way of looking at it, but I mean, it's the true way of looking at it. That is exactly what that is saying. So um, it doesn't say don't feel bad because your children sin, don't feel bad because your parents sin, don't feel bad for this, that, or the other, but it's saying you are not being punished because it's not your fault. They used their free will in a way that was displeasing to the Lord. And notice how he put those two verses about free will right there together. It's amazing how cohesive scripture is when it comes to all of these things. And then it says, you shall not pervert the justice due to a sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord, your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. He has commanded us to provide equal justice. That is something that has been overlooked. And I mean, we can, we can talk about it, but, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the, the homeless situation, how, you know, walking down the street, they're getting their backpacks emptied right there on the corner. I guarantee you that if I walk down the street tomorrow, that same corner, and a, and a police officer comes and, and is, is right there, he's not going to stop me and make me empty out my backpack. Nope. Is that equal justice? Is that fair? I mean, that's, that's not equal justice. Not at all. God expects equal justice. Now, that is not to say that, that if the, the police officer comes to me and asks me to empty my backpack that I don't do it because I'm not homeless. Because I'm to obey the laws of the land. But, you know, when we pervert justice, we are, we are actually, you know, spitting in the face of God. And the other thing that God is saying is he's saying, remember where you came from. Don't get above your race. Yeah. Well, remember where you came from. You were once that, that, that sojourner in another land. Right. You know, all of us, we were not where we are today. At one point in our lives, we were worse than we were today. Amen. So then he closes out with... Uh, Something that, that I believe wholeheartedly. Um, I, will, I will talk about this until the day that I die. But it says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget to sheaf in the field, you shall not go back and get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you should not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When, when they go out for harvest, there's always something left behind. God, the creator, created it to be that way so that all people could be provided for. And here's what I will stand by. 
if we were the stewards of the land that the Lord has called us to be, just like this right here, we would not have to worry about hunger. We would not have to worry about homelessness. We would not have to worry about the needy because they would be provided for, not by us. They would not be provided for by the church or by, by, by community programs or by different charities or, or whatever. They wouldn't have to be because the Lord has established through his creation a, a, a bountiful harvest of which everyone can get what they need. But we, being people, have decided to go against that. And what do we do? When we leave a sheaf in the field, we go back and get it. When we go over our olive trees, we go again to make sure that we have everything to take to market because we don't want one of those sojourners, one of the fatherless or, or one of the poor. We don't want them to get it, right? We, we, we don't want the widow to get it because we want someone to buy it at market because that puts money in our pocket. Money has become a God. And that's the reason that we have all these other problems. And what's funny is the people with the most money are the ones complaining about the problem the most. And they're the ones that created it. Or I can't even say that because they're not the ones that created it, but they're the ones that are allowing it to continue. The, the people before them and the people before them and the people before them and the people before them are the ones that created it. But there is a, a way to stop it. And that is to get back to what God has called us to do as far as being stewards and use what is needed. And look, when they, when they, when, the, so what? They forget a sheaf in the field. So what? They don't take every single olive off of every single tree. So what? There's a few grapes that remain. That doesn't hurt the profitability much. It's still profitable. The Lord is not saying you cannot make a profit off the, 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 the dirt of your hand that's on your hands. What he's saying is he's saying, I'm providing you enough to make a living. I'm providing you enough to provide for your family. I'm providing you enough to maybe even get wealthy. But don't forget about the people that don't have what you have. And I'm placing you as stewards over them. And in the closing verse, he says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. When we go all the way back to the beginning of Exodus, it says that the Lord heard the inner groanings of the Israelites, which means that they were not being fed as they should have been. They were forced into labor. They were, they were treated poorly. They were beaten. They were, they, 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 were, they were trying to kill the firstborn males of every household. Well, every male they were trying to kill in the time of Moses. They were trying to do all of these things to Israel and Israel groaned and whined about it. And God's saying, remember what it felt like because you're gonna have the opportunity to one, do the right thing or two, do exactly what was done to you. And as we get further and further into scripture, when they move into the land and we see the kingdom built and everything else, what we see is we see Israel becomes more and more disobedient in these things. And then, you know, eventually that spreads to everywhere. I mean, the Roman Empire, you know, you're looking, you're looking at, uh, you know, westernized Europe, uh, the, the British Empire. The sun never sets on the British Empire. That was something they say because it was the truth. There was no time where the sun was ever down. Every, at, at some point of the day, something that Britain owned was in sunlight. I mean, isn't that crazy? So, you know, it, it, then us as, as, as our country, you know, we can, we can relate to this because there was a time when we were under the rule of someone who wouldn't let us practice our, our religion the way that we wanted to. They wouldn't let us uh, live the way that we wanted to. Wouldn't let us work the way that we wanted to. Wouldn't let us do all these things. That's why we had the Revolutionary War. But how quickly forget because now we hate it when people think differently than us. We hate it when people uh, when, 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 when people go out and they do their own thing. We hate it when people do these things that, that we hated at some point ourselves. And God's just saying, remember where you came from. I'm giving you enough. Leave enough for the next guy. Questions? Com comments? Well, I was just saying about the the harvest in the field, like Boaz. 
like Boaz, I mean, look at that story in the Bible. What, I mean, he, he told them to let, let them. He gained a wife. He gained, I mean, it was just, you know, it's just a great story. And that's, he was doing God's will. Well, you see, but here's the thing about it. Boaz should have never had to tell his workers that. Right. You get what so I'm saying? Short to turn. Well, but, but, you know, Boaz was in charge of that field. So at some point, Boaz was raping the land. He just happened to find a, 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 a woman that he dug, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's amazing how a woman can help us get back to God real quick. <laughs> And that's a good thing. I mean, my wife led me to the Lord, so I mean, I can't, I'm not, I'm not complaining, but or, or you know, uh, you know, even really making a joke. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, if Boaz was doing properly in the eyes of the Lord to begin with, his workers would have known. His workers wouldn't have even had to be told, "Hey, leave this." Let them, let them get it. It would have already, it would have already been instituted. And I mean, those are the things that we don't look at when we read Scripture, but when. See, when we get to right. the book of Ruth and we start to read about that, we can, it should click in our head. Well, hold on a second. If Boaz is having to tell his workers that, then Boaz wasn't flawless. Boaz was a man just like us. And he was, I mean, he was, because what does it say? It says, I command you to do this. That's the, ignoring a command, a direct command of the Lord. So, you know, Boaz, as great as he is, as great as he was, uh, Boaz was not a perfect man. Boaz was a businessman. And um, he, like I said, he would not have had to command his workers to do that if they were doing right in the first place. And I mean, I, it's a point well taken, yeah. but I don't know if everyone thinks of it that way. But no. that's the way we've got to think of it because we are given examples of folly and given examples. Of, but when Boaz did turn, and did do what the Lord commanded him to do, he was blessed. He was blessed mightily. Right. So there's, there's you know, something that we can take away, and probably what we should walk away with the most today is no matter where we are or where we've been, if we return to what the Lord has commanded us to do, and we do so with a repentant heart and with, with pure intentions, God will reward us. And there's none of us that have done anything beyond being restored. Yeah. Um, I, I, I still like, uh, you know, it, it struck me. I know Nikki dogged me for watching documentaries. Um, but uh, you know what? We're watching a documentary right now. Um, <laughs> a four-parter. Um, huh? Never would have seen Biggest Little Farm if it wasn't for the documentary, uh, you know, uh, affinity that I have. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I can't remember where I was going with that. But, hey, you know, documentaries are good. Um, yeah, what was I talking about when I started to get into that? I said she told me about documentaries, but I was talking about something. I can't remember what it was. It'll come back to me. I'll talk about it on Sunday, probably. Yeah, but, sure. uh, but oh, I know what I was talking about. We watched a documentary on the Son of Sam. Now, those of us that are old enough to remember the Son of Sam, he was a Satan worshiper. Yep. He was he was an evil dude, right? Dude. Well, as he was sitting in his jail cell, the guys that were guards over him would come in. Just you know, they were good men, probably not perfect. But they were good men, and they would talk about what their pastors talked about at church on Sunday, on Monday morning and everything else. And he would hear this, and he started requesting the Bible through the, the prison library and, and other Christian writings and, and everything else. And eventually he gave his heart to Christ. And when he came up for parole, the odds of him getting parole were very slim to none anyway, okay? So I'm not saying that this was a great feat, right? But he walked into that parole hearing and he told them at the very beginning, he said, I don't want to waste your time. He said, I'm not, I don't want parole. He said, it's my purpose to be here in the jail and share Jesus Christ with people that are coming in. So to say that anyone's sin has taken them to a point where they cannot be redeemed, because this is a serial killer who was a Satan worshiper. And now he goes to the infirmary and shares Jesus with people who are on their deathbeds and prays with them. 
So, you know, if it wasn't for documentaries, I wouldn't have that tidbit. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, none of us are beyond redemption, but there's none of us also. <laughs> there's none of us that are beyond reproach either. Okay. So what, what I mean by that is, yes, all of us are redeemable. But yes, all of us are guilty. We are all guilty of something. So, you know, what would I say walk away with today? Well, let's walk away with an understanding of, of what we're being called to do. All of that was tied to loving and, and loving God and loving our neighbors the way that we should. I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty simple concept in theory until we put human emotion and free will in there. Now you put human emotion and free will in there, it makes it very difficult, right? It's hard to love your neighbor when they cut you off in traffic. It's hard to love your neighbor when, when they lie to you. It's hard to love your neighbor when, uh, when, when they steal from you. It's hard to, um, sometimes, it's hard sometimes to understand the right way to love God when your prayer isn't answered the way that you want it to be. That's right. But if we can work on those things and we can be honest with ourselves and look at our own shortcomings, we are on that pathway and on that road to redemption. We've been redeemed through the blood of Christ, but it does not mean that we can't get better at living for Christ. So that's what we're called to do. And um, if we don't have any other comments, now Nikki said, hey, now about the documentaries. Um, but I'm going to defend myself just one more time and just say, you know, I asked her before we started this last documentary, what do you want to watch? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it is what it is. But uh, I'll have Pastor Gary close us out in prayer. Father God, we do just thank you for this and another day that you've given us, Lord. And we thank you for the word that we have here that we've studied, these, these books of laws and and knowing that we are not Israel, but we are your people and we are to be held by them and we are to, to learn from this and learn from these mistakes. And, and uh, I, I know that I've learned and I pray that everyone has. I thank you for the, the word that we have always that you preserve for us throughout the ages to, mm. to guide us and direct us and, and, and to show us how we are to be. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and to give his life saving heaven's blood that we may one day be with with you in heaven. And thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life for me, and not only me, but the whole world. And we pray, Lord, that, that others would come to that same knowledge before it's too late for them. Thank you, Lord, that we can pray and for your that you answer prayers. It may, like Pastor says, it may not be the answer we want, but it's still an answer. And I thank you for that. I thank you that we that you've shown me that 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 the power of prayer is is, 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 is there, that, that it works and it happens that, that if you have the fervent prayer of a righteous person, that it, that, that it will shine through. I thank you, Lord, for the, my church family and all of our uh, 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 saved brothers and sisters and pray, Lord, that we would be that light on the hill that would draw others unto, unto you, not to us, but unto you, that, that, but that we may help bring them to you and, and, and show them the way. Pray, Lord, you would. Just forgive me where I fail. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.